Welcome to another Swordmaster Publications presentation. I'm Ernie Lawrence, and tonight we're going to be studying Deuteronomy chapter 9. And Deuteronomy chapter 9 is a very interesting chapter um, in that God tells them to go in and take the land, but then he reminds them that he's not giving them the land because of them. Um, he's giving them the land because, uh, number one, the people who are there are very, very wicked and need to be removed from the earth, very much like uh, the people of the day of the flood. Uh, that's the, the extent of their wickedness. But also he's giving them the land based on his promises to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and particularly Abraham, uh, for the purpose of bringing Messiah into the world, as, as we know. Uh, but he's, he reminds them in this chapter very much of the uh, rebelliousness of this nation uh, of Israel. And so, uh, anyway, the, the chapter is, <laughs> is, is one where, where God kind of um, reminds them, uh, puts them in their place, humbles them a little bit. Uh, Moses is, a, is the one speaking, of course, but God is speaking through Moses here. So, um, anyway, that's, that's the nature of the chapter, so let's get started. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 1. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day. To go in to possess the nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that they were literally all the way up to uh, outer space or anything like that, um, but their walls were very tall. And so we have a little bit of hyperbole here, but <clears throat> uh, he, he talks about that the nations are greater than Israel, they're mightier than Israel. If, if we just look at the, the physical abilities, uh, if Israel were to try to do this on their own, they would never succeed. They wouldn't get very far at all. Um, verse 2, a people great and tall, and the children of the Anakims, whom you know, of whom you have heard, say, who can stand before the children of Anak? So there's a saying here, is, is that these giants, these Anakims, um, who can stand before them? Because they're so mighty. And uh, so uh, the people themselves were powerful people. They were warriors and, and uh, quite uh, capable in, in battle. And so uh, Israel is not physically capable on their own uh, of doing the thing that God has set before them to do. And that's uh, part of the purpose that God has chosen this nation is that there's no way for them to say, I did this. So they can't. They can't put it on themselves and 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 take it upon themselves to say that this is something that they did, uh, because uh, if you if you calculated everything in terms of just the physical, Israel didn't have a chance. There's there's no way. They were fewer in number. They were physically weaker. Um, they were going up against uh, mighty cities with with powerful walls made of stone, not of of wood, and uh, it's just not something that would have been possible. <clears throat> And so verse 3 says, Understand therefore this day that Jehovah your God is he which goes over before you as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them. And we're going we're gonna to look forward to this uh, phrase, consuming fire, here in just a minute. Uh, he's a consuming fire. And he shall destroy them and he shall bring them down before your face. So shall you drive them out and destroy them quickly as Jehovah has said unto you. So there's, there's two things that they're going to do. They're going to drive them out. So again... Those who, who uh, say that this is absolute genocide, um, obviously God is saying drive them out of the land one way or another uh, and destroy them completely from the land. They're to wipe out their culture. Uh, and so uh, God is giving them this command. But he says, I am a consuming fire. The next time we read this phrase is in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, uh, verse 29, it says, For... Our God is a consuming fire. And that word for, of course, uh, is a conclusion to the matter of what's been talked about just before. And uh, we could read the whole chapter, but uh, <clears throat> we're, we're talking in this chapter of Hebrews 12 about the contrast between uh, the old physical Israel and the new spiritual Israel. And in fact, verse 22, it says, But you are come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So there's the contrast, not physical Jerusalem, but heavenly Jerusalem or spiritual Jerusalem to an innumerable company of messengers to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. So the new Jerusalem is the church. Spiritual Israel is the church, not this physical nation. Uh, Jesus is the mediator of a, a new covenant uh, that speaks better things than that of Abel. 
uh, and so forth. So look at look at this verse 26 down to 29, which concludes in this phrase, whose voice then shook the earth, the land. That's that's talking about what we're talking about just now in, in Deuteronomy, and what we're going to read about actually happening in the book of Joshua. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And so the, this phrase here of earth and heaven ties directly into uh, the nations that are being spoken of in this context, which in this case is, of course, uh, Israel, the, the, what's the remnants of Israel, which is the Jews, Judah, the southern kingdom. <clears throat> And um, it's a stirring up of the, uh, the, the land. Obviously, the church is getting its start in Jerusalem and, and in the promised land, but it was going to spread out from Jerusalem uh, throughout all of Palestine and even out to the rest of the world, but also heaven. And that's the authority, that's the, the rule. The, the nation of Israel was uh, ruled by the Herods, it was uh, a theocracy, so you had the Levitical priesthood, um, and you had all of this, uh, you had the Sanhedrin Council, all of this authority that was heaven was going to be shaken up as well, and then when all of the dust cleared, you would have a new heavens and a new earth, uh, which is what Second Peter 3 talks about, which is the church with, with Jesus as king, and it's a completely new system of things. And so... Um, all of this ties back into where we're reading right now in Deuteronomy chapter 9. It says, And this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken. The system was going to be removed out of the way as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken uh, may remain. So uh, Israel being a physical nation was made, it was forged uh, by God and would eventually fulfill its purpose and did fulfill its purpose, brought Messiah into the world and then they killed him, and then they just became the number one persecutors of the church. And so God is going to remove them out of the way. And then the things which cannot be shaken, which is the church, Deuteronomy, I mean, uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, a kingdom that could not be destroyed would be established during the Roman Empire, and that's the church. And so that, uh, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. All that was going to be left was the church after Judaism was moved out of the way. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. That's obviously the church is, is what we're talking about here. The removal of, of the Jewish state in favor of uh, this kingdom which cannot be moved is the church is so obvious in this passage. And I, I don't understand why there's so many people who, who read this and, and don't get it. And they don't make the comparison back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9 and, and some of these other places where where the the wickedness was being swept away in, play, in favor of a, of a new system um, and it was the movement of nations and how that ties into the things that happened in the first century it's very very obvious in Hebrews chapter 12 but um, uh, people miss it millennialism is very very strong and uh, they they interpret everything under that paradigm and it doesn't fit. It, there's no way that it fits because we uh, are receiving. It's, it's a present tense thing. We are receiving right now a kingdom which cannot be moved. They were, that was the first century when this was written. They were receiving that kingdom right then. And that kingdom is the church. And the millennialism says, no, they didn't receive a kingdom. Uh, Jesus came to establish a kingdom, but he failed, or, or he, you know, the people rejected him, and so he stepped aside and, and was going to wait. And then 2,000 years later, now the kingdom is going to be established, or whatever. And they don't get it. The church was to them a stopgap, a, a, a plan B, or something like that. And that's silly. That's not what the authors of the New Testament say at all. We are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, in contrast to what we're reading about in, De in Deuteronomy 9, where they served um, with abject fear, that, that not of God, but of their enemies. And they did not hold reverence to God. They, they, were, uh, they lacked faith in God. And so you have a complete contrast between the church 
and and Judah going on here in the book of Hebrews and then the Hebrew writer quotes Deuteronomy chapter 9 and says for our God is a consuming fire because they don't learn the lesson the Jews did not learn the lesson of Deuteronomy 9 no matter that they've been reading it for uh, almost 1500 years <clears throat> so anyway uh, this is just kind of a look forward here because uh, of what is going on in this particular context uh, so they were to drive them out destroy them quickly as Jehovah had said unto them in the verse 3 then verse 4 speak not you in your heart after that Jehovah your God has cast them out from before you saying for my righteousness Jehovah has brought me into possession uh, into possess this land uh, don't don't come into the land and and they're all cast out and and think that it's about you Israel that this nation that you are it's not about you at all you are not the point you are not the purpose and so many people get that wrong they think that Israel is the point Israel is not the point Israel is just the vehicle they're like the wrapper of a candy bar the point is eating the candy bar they're not the candy bar they're the wrapper and um, so God tells them don't think it's about you and then he says this is why it's because of the wickedness of these nations that Jehovah does drive them out from before you they're so wicked they need to be driven out and, and consumed and destroyed and, and ended as nations and then he says not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart do you go in to possess this land but because of the wickedness of these nations Jehovah your God does drive them out from before you that he may perform the word which Jehovah swear unto your fathers Abraham Isaac and Jacob so it was it was about driving out the wicked nations because they needed their wickedness had been filled up that it was all full and and God could stand them no longer being on his creation so he said go in and destroy these nations because of their wickedness and because of the promise that he gave to faithful Abraham and then through him Isaac and Jacob that was the reason and then he's going to remind them if it's about you let's talk about you for just a second verse 6 understand therefore that Jehovah your God gives you not this good land to possess it for your righteousness for you are a stiff necked people you guys are super stubborn it isn't about you at all don't think that it has anything to do with you because you guys are stubborn and God said well Moses is saying let me remind you just how stubborn you are remember and forget not how you provoked Jehovah your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you did, did depart out of the land of Egypt in other words the day that God that God brought them out of Egypt by all of the mighty powerful things that he did the ten plagues the the spreading of the waters of the Red Sea that they could draw across on dry land. He does all of these obviously overpowering, just amazing works that none of the fake false gods had ever considered doing with with the magicians and the, the kings behind the scenes. That, that was beyond the power of men. And from day one, they complained and whined and let's go back to Egypt it was better there he says from the day that you departed out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place you have been rebellious against Jehovah it's not about you it's not about you at all Israel because you have been a rebellious whiny set of brats also in Horeb that's Sinai you provoked Jehovah to wrath so that Jehovah was angry with you to have destroyed you remember <clears throat> God wanted to start over with Moses and Moses says please don't do that please don't start over you know I, I, I can't handle it okay you've already promised that you're gonna bring them to the land of, of Canaan please don't destroy them and start over with me um, but he, he he provoked they, they provoked him to anger he says, when I was gone up into the mount to receive the tablets of stone, this is, this is talking about Moses. He says, uh, Moses says, when I was gone up to the mount to receive the tablets of stone, even the tables of the covenant which Jehovah made with you, I bowed in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. I didn't eat or drink. 40 days and 40 nights. Sounds familiar. And Jehovah delivered unto me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all 
the words which Jehovah spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. All of the commands that they were supposed to have were written on those tablets. He was up there 40 days, 40 nights, no food, no water, listening to God give the commandment to preserve this nation. And when he comes down, verse 11, it says, When I came to pass, uh, it came to pass at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, Jehovah gave me the two tablets of stone, even the tables of the covenant. Jehovah said to me, Arise, get you down quickly from here, for the people which you brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. You know, we're, we're talking not even a year. Uh, and it happens fast. People talk about, well, what about the great apostasy? Um, that was supposed to happen before the quote-unquote Antichrist. You get the, the millennialists get all of their, their concepts and their terms mixed up. They, they throw in Antichrist in with the, the uh, idea of revelation and the, the so-called apocalypse and all of that. And so they, they say that <clears throat> the uh, son of perdition um, is the Antichrist. And they, they just jumble it all together. Um, and they say that uh, uh, when... Uh, he's supposed to come there was going to be a great falling away first there was going to be a great apostasy and that hasn't happened yet or that hadn't happened in the first century um, I, it totally had look at galatians look at galatians chapter one i marvel that you are so soon removed here it happened within a year the 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 separate congregations and the, the judaizers and, and the gnostics starting up all of that happened in a very short amount of time people can go from faithful to, to rebellious very quickly and so uh, God says Moses you need to get back down there because <clears throat> they're messing up it says uh, rise get down quickly for your people which you have brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves they are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them and they have made a molten image well they ain't got the commandments down to them yet and here they are making a, a, a fake false god like what Egypt would have. Furthermore, Jehovah spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. And so God is so angry with them because of their rebellion and because of they, they had so quickly forgotten all the things that he had done for them, bringing them out of Egypt. He's like, Moses, I'm going to start over with you. And then Moses says, I turned and came down from the mountain, and the mount burned with fire, and the two tablets of covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, you had sinned against Jehovah your God, and had made a molten calf. You had turned aside quickly out of the way which Jehovah had commanded you. It happened very quickly, very soon. They hadn't, they hadn't been out but a year. And here they are, making idols. Uh, something that they, they, they crafted with their own hands to worship. I don't, I don't know that you'll get how stupid that sounds to me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this piece of paper here and I'm gonna fold up a little image and and I'm gonna put it here before me and I'm gonna worship it. That's stupid. It's ridiculous. Why would you do that? You you made this, and now you're gonna bow down and worship it. Do you? It's just not. It's like something's wrong with you mentally. To be able to do that and then on top of that you're doing it a year after you personally were witness to these powerful plagues of punishment not just against egypt but these plagues that represented god's command over the fake false gods of egypt he was knocking down their god showing how fake they were one after the other and then he brings you across the red sea it lets you come across on dry land. Military might of Egypt follows after. They get stuck in the mud. The waters come and destroy them. That's all God. And a year later, they take some gold and they made a cow. And they decided to worship the cow. I mean, it's, it's just mind-boggling how these people could do that. Now, we're, here we are 3,500 years later with a little bit of hindsight. Um... So I guess it, it's kind of easy for us to, to, to see that. But, you know, people have their, their molten calves today. They still do it. They still worship the creation rather than the creator. Um, I don't know why, but they do. Uh, 
but he reminds them, Moses reminds them how quickly they had turned away um, from from Jehovah who, do all, who had done all these things. <clears throat> Moses said, I took the two tablets and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. And I fell down before Jehovah as at the first, forty days and forty nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which you sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of Jehovah to provoke him to anger. So apparently Moses couldn't eat for another 40 days or, or 40 nights. So he's he's up to 80 days. This is almost three months that Moses has gone without food and water uh, because of, of all that he's going through. Of course, God is obviously sustaining him. But um, it says, For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith Jehovah was wroth against you to destroy you. Moses was afraid that God was going to destroy them and start over with him. But Jehovah hearkened unto me at that time. Moses pled for Israel, says, please, please, please don't destroy them. And because Moses was considered the friend of God, God listened to him. Jehovah was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. So Aaron was going to get wiped out with the rest of them. And Moses pled for his brother and said, please don't destroy him. <clears throat> and then he says, I took your sin, the calf which you had made, and burned it with fire and stamped it and ground it very small even until it was as small as dust, and I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. And at Tibera, and at Massa, and at Kibroth Hatava, you provoked Jehovah to wrath. Likewise, when Jehovah sent you from Kadesh Barnea, that's this, this when the spies went out, um, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, you rebelled against the commandment of Jehovah your God, and you believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. Now again, remember, <clears throat> these are the children of the people who had done all of this. The, these, these people that Moses are talking to, is, is actually talking to are the children, the offspring. They weren't old enough at the time to be actually guilty of these things. But what Moses is, is trying to impress upon them is how stupid their parents were and the consequences that their parents faced because of their stupidity and he's reminding them of that, saying, if you act like them, God's going to treat you like them. And God is saying that I'm not giving you this land because you're special. I'm giving you this land to fulfill my promise to Abraham and to, and to end these wicked nations. Pay attention, Israel, because if you end up like these nations that you're going in to destroy, I'm going to destroy you too. That's the message of this chapter. And so these children, whose parents all died in the wilderness, these, these children are now grown up to adults. God says, if you act like them, you're going to get what they got. So it says that they rebelled against Jehovah, believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. Verse 24, you have been rebellious against Jehovah from the day that I knew you. And he's, he's talking about the nation as a whole here. He's not specifically referring to these individual people because none of them actually were part of that rebellion individually. <clears throat> but as a nation, they were guilty. And as a nation, they would end up paying the price. And we see that over and over again. Throughout the history of Israel, the nation pays the price for the wickedness of the nation. Even though there are a remnant of faithful in all times throughout, the faithful are preserved. In the New Testament time, we see that as well. The faithful of Israel, usually the poor and downtrodden, very few of the leaders, uh, perhaps Nicodemus and, and a couple of others, um, the Joseph of uh, Arimathea and some of those guys, uh, were preserved but they were preserved in the church, not as Israel. They weren't preserved as the nation. They were preserved individually within the church. The nation of Israel is destroyed for their wickedness. God's promise to them, if you act like these nations that you're going in to destroy, if you start acting like them, I'm going to destroy you the same way. They start acting like them. They did it for 1,500 years, eventually murder God's son. God destroys them, as promised. <clears throat> Verse 26, I prayed therefore unto Jehovah and said, O Jehovah God, destroy not your people and your inheritance. 
which you have redeemed through your greatness, which you have brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Talking about the plagues and the, and the, the miracles. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to the, their wickedness, nor to their sin, lest the land which you brought us out say, because Jehovah was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. <clears throat> and so Moses is, is pleading with God. This was his, his uh, plea that we read about back in Exodus, that they God not destroy them. And, and he reasons with him. He says, if you do that, if you destroy these people out in the wilderness, what are the nations round about going to say? And, and why is that important to, to highlight? Because Israel was selected out of the world and made a holy people and a holy nation to bless all of the other nations of the world, to be set up as a light. If they were righteous and they did the will of God, the other nations of the world would look to them and say, they serve Jehovah God and look at how he blesses them. I want to be like that. I want some of that. Let me serve Jehovah God as well. That's the that's what they were intended to to be. If they were righteous, this is what Israel would have been. And, and, and in the days of David and the early days of Solomon, that's exactly what they were. Everybody round about came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And it just, it, it was a specific purpose that if God had destroyed Israel and started over with Moses, would have been thwarted. And so God allows Moses to convince him not to destroy Israel and start over with him. And so verse 29 ends, Yet they are thy people and thine inheritance, which you brought out with a mighty power and by your stretched out arm. So Moses, Moses says, You need to remember this, Israel. You need to remember that God was ready to destroy your uh, parents. The whole of Israel was on the brink of being completely wiped out a year after God brought them out of Egypt because of their rebellion, their stubbornness. And so if you go into the land and, and you conquer the land uh, with, with God leading the way and, and God providing victory for you and then you think that it's all about you, it's not going to end well. And it, it's, a, it's a powerful point. So... Um, Anyway, that wraps up uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9. <clears throat> I don't want to drag it out. It's a, kind of a, a I don't want to say depressing, but it's a, it's a, a pretty powerful, corrective, uh, kind of a warning type uh, message, a woe unto Israel. Um, so not, not exactly the most positive and upbeat message, um, but it's one they needed to hear. It's a, it's a corrective uh, or preventative, I guess, is the best way to put it. It's a preventative type uh, lesson that Moses is giving him here in, in Deuteronomy chapter 9. So uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm hoping you will leave questions in the comments. Uh, if you have other ways to, to contact me, a lot of you that, that are subscribers right now, you do. You are certainly welcome to contact me however you wish. Um, and we can talk about these things. If you have questions or disagreements, always glad to talk about anything and um you know there's always room for growth even for me um i don't i don't know everything um i make mistakes so um please don't think that i'm i'm coming at you guys as if i i know all of this uh 100 i could certainly make mistakes so um but anyway i appreciate your time i appreciate you tuning this in uh, uh share it let others know um let them join in on the discussion here and uh we will uh, <clears throat> we will continue to, to study this together. Um, it's been another Swordmaster Publications presentation. My name is Ernie Lawrence, and you guys have a wonderful night.